to learn about salmon fry. Last week with Becca, you learned about Alvin, those tiny little just hatched fish that stay in their red with a yolk sac attached to their belly like a built-in lunchbox. Like other stages of salmon, they need to have plenty of pl native plants in the riparian zone to help keep that water nice and shaded and cool. When those alvin get a little bigger, big enough to leave the red, they're called fry. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Fry are big enough to leave the red and start to live in the open water of the stream. But they're still tiny, only a couple of inches long. And I have some right here. So those are those eggs that we learned about. These are the alvin with their little lunchbox bellies attached. And then these are the fry, and they're still really tiny. Since fry are so small, they need places that don't have much current, so they don't get washed away. Do you remember those riffles that we talked about, where all the oxygen gets pulled into the water for them to breathe and the water is moving really fast? Well, just like it's important to have enough riffles in the stream, it's also important to have pools. What do you think a pool is? Pools are deeper, slow-moving, or even still bodies of water where salmon fry and other small organisms can take shelter from the current to hide from predators or hunt for food. One place that pools tend to form is behind big logs that fall into the stream. We call those logs large woody debris. And that's another reason why it's so important to have big trees and other native plants in our riparian zone that Becca talked about in the last video. Those pools that they form are perfect habitat for salmon fry to use to hide from predators and hunt for their prey. Black cottonwood trees are one native tree that's really good at making pools. They fall down and drop branches all the time. And those branches and logs form wonderful little pools where the salmon fry can live. All of that woody debris is also really important because it feeds the bugs in the stream and the bugs are what the salmon eat. Now, we're all scientists here, so I'm going to teach you a big fancy science word that we use to talk about stream bugs. Are you ready? This is it. Aquatic macroinvertebrates. That's a huge word, right? Like, it barely even fits on my whiteboard. So let's try to figure out what it means. Let's start with that aquatic part. Where have you, heard that prefix aqua before. Maybe in aquarium, or aquaman, or agua. What do all those words have in common? Water, right? So aqua means water. Now, let's go on to that next part, macro. Have you ever heard a prefix that sounds sort of like mic macro. I kind of gave it away there, right? You've heard micro before, probably. Heard of a microscope or a microphone? What do those have in common? They're making something big, right? They're taking something really small, like a small voice or a little bacterium, and making them sound or look bigger. So micro means small. Macro is the opposite. Macro means big. And then we have vertebra. Does anybody know what a vertebra is? Vertebrae are your backbones. So if you reach behind and feel all those bumps along your spine, those are your vertebrae. So vertebra is backbone. And what about that prefix in? If you're incapable of something, can you do it? No. In means no, so incapable means not capable. Invertebrate means no backbone. So when we put all of those together, we have something that's big, has no backbone, and lives in water. Now, when we say big, and we're talking about stream bugs, do you think that means these bugs are like the size of an elephant? No. We're just talking about something that's big enough to see. 
So aquatic macroinvertebrates are bugs that are big enough to see, that live in the water, and have no backbone. We care about aquatic macroinvertebrates for a couple of reasons. First, that's what salmon eat, and a stream with no salmon food probably isn't very good for salmon. Second, there's something that we call indicator species. Indicator species are species that tell us something about their habitat just by being there. We can use them as a sort of shortcut way to test the quality of the water and the health of the stream without having to have any of the tools that you would use to measure those things. Aquatic macroinvertebrates are indicator species because different invertebrates can tolerate different amounts of pollution, and we classify them into three different groups based on how much pollution they can tolerate. Group 1 macroinvertebrates are really, really sensitive to pollution. They need their water to be perfectly clean. They are the pickiest of the bugs. And so if we find them, we know that the water is pretty clean. Some group 1 macroinvertebrates are stonefly nymphs, caddisfly larvae, and mayfly nymphs. Now those words nymphs and larvae, they just mean babies. So baby stoneflies, baby caddisflies, and baby mayflies are all group 1 macroinvertebrates that can't tolerate much pollution. Group 2 macroinvertebrates are bugs like water beetles and dragonfly nymphs. They can live in really clean water, but they can also tolerate a moderate amount of pollution. Now, you might have noticed that I said that one example was dragonfly nymphs, and thought, wait, I thought dragonflies were those things that I see flying around with the two really long straight wings. Don't they live on land? Well, this is one of my favorite things about aquatic macroinvertebrates. A lot of them are the nymphs, or baby forms, of bugs that as adults live on land or fly around in the air, bugs that we might see around quite a lot. Just like the stonefly nymphs, caddisfly larvae, and mayfly nymphs of group 1, dragonfly nymphs start out as an egg in the water. They hatch out and live in the water as nymphs for a few weeks to even a few years. And then they go through metamorphosis, just like a caterpillar changing into a butterfly, and emerge to live as adults on land. Those adults that we're really familiar with and we see around. So next time you see a dragonfly flying around, think about where it might have come from. What stream or pond could that dragonfly have spent the beginning of its life growing in? Or even better, if you have a stream or a pond nearby, go out and poke around in the mud, sift through it gently, and see if you can find any of those critters, because they're really cool. And because they're so cool, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. Dragonfly nymphs are one of my favorite bugs. And I'm going to show you why. They're super cool. So what I want you to do is take your arms and hold them like this. And now imagine that on all your fingers you have giant wolverine claws. Huge spikes. If you were a dragonfly nymph, this whole thing, from your elbows to your shoulders all the way down to your hands, this whole scoop would be your mouth. Your bottom jaw. So dragonfly nymphs lower jaw goes all the way down to their waist and they've got these spikes on the end and it can curve out like a backhoe scoop and they use it to grab their prey and bring it back in on those spikes. So they usually catch with that bottom jaw things like other bugs, usually bugs that are smaller than them but sometimes even other dragonfly nymphs and they can even eat tadpoles or little tiny fish, like our salmon fry. So dragonfly nymphs are both food for salmon and their predators. Anyway, back to indicator species. There's one more group of aquatic macroinvertebrates, and you'll never guess what it's called. We have group one, we have group two, and now this one is group three. Group three macroinvertebrates can tolerate almost any level of pollution. They are the toughest bugs in the stream, and they can put up with pretty much anything the stream throws at them. But they can also live in clean water. Some group 3 invertebrates are midges, aquatic worms, and some snails. So you might have noticed all of these groups, groups 1, 2, and 3, can live in really clean water. So 
how do we tell if the water's polluted or not? Well, imagine you go to a stream and we find group one and group three invertebrates. Then is the stream healthy or not? Chances are it's probably really healthy because you found those group one invertebrates. Even though you found group three invertebrates and they can put up with really nasty water, the water was nasty, the group one bugs wouldn't be there at all. What tells us the most about the health of a stream is the combination of bugs that we find. If we find any group one invertebrates at all, the stream is probably clean because otherwise they wouldn't be there. But if we only find groups two and three, or only find group three, then the water is probably polluted. And if we're only finding group three, then it's probably really bad. Now, I have a project for you. I've told you about a few of the different aquatic macroinvertebrates, including my very favorite dragonfly nymph. And my challenge for you is to choose one that's really interesting, learn about it, and then build it. So using only clean recycling and trash, and do please make sure you clean it first, I want you to try to build a model of an aquatic macroinvertebrate. Research that invertebrate. So choose one and learn about how does it eat? How many legs does it have? How does it get around? Then use any plastic, cardboard, or paper recycling that you have to try to build a model as accurate as you can. Please, please don't use any sharp metal or glass or anything that you might hurt yourself with. And make sure that any recycling and trash that you do use is totally clean. So to give you an idea of what this might look like, let me show you what I built. I made myself a model of a damselfly nymph, which is related to dragonflies. I learned that they have six legs that they use to walk around on the stream bottom and in stream vegetation with these two little claws at the end of each leg. I learned that they have wing pads on their backs that will eventually turn in to those huge wings on the dragonflies and damselflies that we're used to seeing flying around. They have three gills that are shaped kind of like feathers sticking off their butt that they use to breathe. On their faces, they've got two wide set eyes and that crazy jaw. So this is what that jaw looks like that I was talking about. And I made it out of cardboard and boxes and bottle caps, Tupperware and a can. And I invite you to share your creations with us by emailing a photo to education at mtsgreenway.org and maybe we'll share it on our Facebook page. Don't forget to watch our next video about salmon smolt and have fun making your macroinvertebrate. See you next time!